The first chapter of Lumen Fidei, Pope Francis' first encyclical, speaks of our faith in terms of salvation history. Pope Francis begins by going all the way back to Abraham, our father in faith, and he notices that faith begins by hearing. God speaks to Abraham, and Abraham has faith. And in doing so, God reveals himself as a personal God. He's not the God of a particular place or a particular season or time. He is the God of people, a God of a person, Abraham. And he opens up the future to Abraham through a promise. Now remember, in the previous video, I talked about the way in which our faith points us to a future. It points us to our potential. And this is what happens with Abraham. Abraham is asked to trust in this word that he hears as a solid rock. He is given a promise that he will be the father of a great nation. And as St. Augustine points out, and Pope Francis quotes him on this, he says that man is faithful when he believes in God and God's promises. God is faithful when he grants what is promised. And so Abraham believes this promise that's given to him and that he will be the father of a great nation. Now, incidentally, we should also note that this is true even of consequences as well. So God not only promises good things when we follow his commands and things, but he also promises us the results of what will happen if we don't follow his commands. This is why a lot of times we see in the Old Testament the wrath of God. It's a way of showing God's fidelity, his faithfulness, because he's true to what he had said. Now, it's important going back to Abraham to understand that God's call isn't something that's alien to our experience. What God calls Abraham to, to be this father of this great nation, actually represents something that's at the deepest longing of Abraham, this notion of being a father. And having progeny, having children. And so God is tapping into that and calling Abraham to the fullest potential of his humanity, of his humanness, his human nature. Now, the history of Israel, as we continue to go forward, tends to be this whole story about the fidelity and infidelity of Israel. What happens when you're faithful and unfaithful? See, Israel often falls in, this great nation falls into this great temptation towards unbelief. Right? I mean, we can think of the golden calf incident that happened with Moses. But there's many times throughout sacred scripture where the people of Israel give in to unbelief. Unbelief, of course, is the opposite of faith. And what happens is we see as we turn away from God and start to turn towards these idols, we don't become free. We actually limit ourselves. We become limited. You know, so often in our society today, we can think of this uh, because many people think of God as limiting. And we need to free ourselves from God so that we can reach our full potential as human beings. But what scripture shows us is God doesn't limit us. He's not in competition with us. God shows us the path forward to live out our full potential. It's when we turn towards these idols that we become limited. When we turn towards money, towards power, towards these earthly things, that all of a sudden we become limited and we're not able to reach the fullness of our potential. Now, as the story unfolds, we see mediators start to develop. Most notably, we can think of Moses, the great mediator between God and the people. Now, this notion of mediation strikes us in the Western world as somewhat harsh. We're used to our radical independence where we say, I don't need anybody else to intervene for me. I can take care of things myself. And we view mediation sometimes as a sign of weakness or an obstacle, perhaps. But it's not. It's actually, it's an opening. Through other people, we realize that our encounter with these other people can bring us up to a higher truth, a truth that's greater than ourselves. It, but we can only reach that potential when we're in union with other people. So this notion of mediation shouldn't be seen as something that's limiting or some kind of a weakness on our part, but rather bringing us to a greater sense of who we are as human beings. And ultimately, it brings us to this greater truth. The truth, of course, is Jesus Christ. St. Augustine speaks of the faith of the fathers, and he says that the faith of the fathers always pointed towards Christ. In other words, the Jewish faith is constantly pointing towards Christ. Christ. It's reaching its fulfillment and its climax in Christ. Christ is the definitive yes to all of the Jewish promises that were made in the Old Testament. He is the supreme manifestation of God and God's love for us. And the way we know that is because God becomes a human being and dwells among us. You see, no other God would do that. No other God enters into this personal relationship with humanity and dwells among human beings who lowers himself to that level, so to speak. The other gods, if you think about the Greek gods and the Roman 
Roman gods, they use humanity as pawns in their schemes, but they never enter into a relationship with God, or with, with uh, human beings. These gods don't. But our God does. Our God is a God of love who enters into relationship with us. And what we're asked to do is to have faith in this God, to trust in his promises. And ultimately, the greatest of his promises is manifest in Jesus Christ, where he dwells among us. He says, I am your God. I am walking amongst you, and I am with you here on earth. And we're asked ultimately to believe not in Christ so much as in, like, we believe about him and all these doctrines, but we're actually asked to enter into union with him, to become united with Christ. That's the ultimate goal of our faith, is to become united with God. That's what salvation is all about. You see, Paul gets in scripture into these great arguments with the Pharisees over the nature of salvation, because the nature of salvation, as the Pharisees see it, it comes from fidelity to the law. But see, in doing that, what Paul recognizes is that this is a form of self-justification. It's a form of self-centeredness still. I mean, you can do all these great works and follow the law, but if you're thinking that you're earning your salvation, you're still focused in on yourself. What we are called to do is to enter into this greater relationship with others. And that's what salvation brings us to. And ultimately, the ultimate other that we enter into this relationship with is Jesus Christ himself, God himself, who we seek to be grafted onto, who we seek to be bound to, to be united with. Because when we're united with Christ, all of a sudden what happens is we see world, the world not through our own eyes, but through the eyes of Christ. And it's because Christ is truth, we all of a sudden can see the world as it truly is. We see the truthfulness of the world, and we're not seeing a limited view of the world, but we're seeing the full potential of the world. So in other words, Christ opens to us the full potential of the world when we're united with him, because we can see the world as it truly is through the eyes of faith, through Christ. Now, the final point that the Pope makes in this first chapter is that once we've seen this truth, once we have heard it with our ears and accepted it in our hearts, that word that we have heard needs to be preached. We need to speak this word. As he points out, quoting scripture again, he says, how can people believe in a God of whom they've never heard? So it's important for us as Christians not only to hear as Abraham did, but then once we hear, it becomes incumbent upon us to speak that word, to proclaim that word to all people so that they too can be grafted on to get to Christ, that they too can be united with God and see reality as it truly is.